Today, we are talking about why AI advantage compounds. Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. Today's topic is something I'm sure that for some of you will be kind of like, well, duh. But I think for others, especially those of you who are trying to advocate for AI initiatives inside your organizations, the point at the core here is really important. And especially for those who are perhaps not as advanced in their AI journey, could represent a fairly important shift in their way of thinking. We are now three years into the Gen AI era. In that time, pretty much every organization, large and small, has at least started to dabble with how Gen AI could impact how they do business. However, there is, of course, a huge breadth and range of how different companies are engaging with AI. We have everything from nascent experiments or a sort of DIY posture that allows employees to go figure it out for themselves but doesn't really have anything formal at the organization level to, on the other end of the spectrum, extremely sophisticated and comprehensive org-wide efforts. The point of today's episode is that the stakes for the organizations that are starting to lag are perhaps even higher than they think. Increasingly, we are seeing how AI advantage compounds. In other words, how the enterprise AI rich get richer and are likely to grow the gap between them and peers and competitors who are not moving as swiftly with AI, rather than see that gap shrink as the laggards start to catch up. Like I said, for some of you, this may be intuitive, but the important thing is that we're starting to see evidence of this. Now, before we fully get into it, over the last week, we've talked about a couple of different reports. We've talked about the State of Enterprise AI report from OpenAI, as well as the Menlo State of Generative AI in the Enterprise report, which is their third annual. And in the background, we are working on the analysis of the AI ROI benchmarking survey, which ended up having people submit and quantify more than 5,000 use cases. As this was all happening, we also got a new pulse survey from EY. And since we haven't talked about that in a previous show, I want to talk about a couple of the highlights. This was once again a poll of about 500 U.S. senior leaders, and much of what they found is very similar to these other reports. Quite simply, as they put it, the early promise of AI is no longer speculative. 96% of the leaders surveyed are seeing AI-driven productivity gains, with 57% of them seeing significant gains. 96% of those surveyed are also seeing significant measurable improvements in overall financial performance, with only 4% saying they're seeing no measurable improvements in overall financial performance. Now, interestingly, there are still lots of challenges. One that they hone in on is what they call the attribution conundrum, where they say in some cases it's difficult to specifically attribute those productivity gains directly to AI. 88% of leaders said that AI-driven productivity is a key metric that leaders at their organization are evaluated on, but about two-thirds, 65%, said their organization struggles to tie certain productivity gains directly to AI adoption. Also, in a good reminder that self-reporting and qualitative studies can only tell us so much, EY did find that there was something of an over-optimistic streak among the leaders that they surveyed in terms of how much budget they were actually going to put towards AI. For example, in 2024, 65% of those surveyed said that they expected their organization to invest at least a million dollars into AI. And while it wasn't far off, in 25, 58% of their organizations said that they actually do. There was a bit more of a gap among those who anticipated investing 10 million or more. In 24, a little over a third at 34% of leaders said that their organizations would spend $10 million on AI, but the number in reality was only 23%. Now, there are some other interesting statistics from this, but I want to put them in the context of this larger compounding idea. So I'll sum up with a paragraph from their introduction, which is so resonant based on everything else we've been hearing recently. What separates leaders now is not the number of tools, but the discipline of enterprise-wide integration. Successful businesses will move from isolated experiments to enterprise transformation, weaving AI into how the business runs and embedding responsibility from the jump. All right, so let's come back to this idea of AI advantage compounding and put it together across all of these different sources. So first, let's talk about the usage gap and the idea that leaders are actually using AI differently. OpenAI called those in the 95th percentile of adoption intensity frontier workers and frontier organizations. These frontier workers generate six times as many messages as the median worker, and frontier organizations generate two times as many messages per seat than the median enterprise. And importantly, this gap widens when you look at complex tasks. Frontier workers are 10 times as active in analysis and calculations and 17 times more active in coding compared to the median. Now, based on OpenAI's research, they find that as organizations move from simple use to more mature, complex use, they move more and more of their work to these custom GPTs because they become repositories of context and knowledge. And so when you see that frontier organizations are sending seven times as many messages to GPTs, it means that they're not just chatting more, but have fundamentally integrated AI into more complex workflows. What's more, these more complex uses 
are making up a growing portion of the total overall enterprise usage. The number of weekly users of custom GPTs in projects was up 19x. About a fifth of all enterprise messages now are going through custom GPTs or through projects. Now, the next interesting thing to note is that there's evidence in a bunch of places that more usage begets more value in a non-linear way. So previewing some of the results from the AI ROI benchmarking survey, we divided impact into eight different types of benefits. Cost savings, time savings, increased revenue, new capabilities, improved decision-making, risk reduction, and a couple of others. And we found that respondents who shared use cases with a wider breadth of benefit types reported higher ROI the more benefit types their use cases had. With a three representing modest ROI gains and four representing significant, those whose use cases had just one benefit type had a mean ROI of 3.13, those who reported four benefit types had a mean ROI of 3.35, and those who reported eight benefit types saw a mean ROI of 3.65. OpenAI also identified this phenomenon of people with more intensive AI use getting more value. Workers who save over 10 hours a week use about eight times as much intelligence than those reporting zero hours saved. They're also using multiple models, more tools, and AI across more types of work. They also found that workers who engage across more different task types report more time saved than those using fewer task types. Specifically, workers who engaged across seven task types reported five times as much time saved than those using only four task types. Let's double-click, however, on this idea of time savings as the metric. As I mentioned, we divided things into eight different potential benefit types. And what we found is, on the one hand, time savings is for sure the universal entry point to AI value. More than 76% of respondents to the AI ROI benchmarking study reported time savings as at least one of the benefits across the use cases that they quantified. However, time savings overall has a weaker correlation with high ROI than some other categories of benefits. The strongest predictors of high ROI were in use cases whose primary benefit was improved decision-making, new capabilities, or increased revenue, suggesting that as individuals and organizations move up the value chain from the simple surface layer of time savings towards deeper, more complex, and sophisticated uses of AI, they are getting differentiated, again, non-linear ROI value as compared to those simpler use cases, which are the domain of many of the laggard organizations. It turns out there is also a money side of this. According to the EY survey, organizations that invested $10 million or more in their survey were far more likely to see significant productivity gains compared to those investing less than $10 million. For those investing less than $10 million, 52% said their organization had seen significant AI productivity gains, and that number jumped to 71% for those investing $10 million or more. And the important thing is that the big spenders seeing big results are then immediately plowing those gains back in to get further ahead. 96% of organizations that are seeing gains are then reinvesting them. 47% are reinvesting into expanding their existing AI capabilities. 42% are putting it into developing new AI capabilities. And 39% are putting it back into research and development. Only 17% are reducing headcount, and only 24% are returning capital to stakeholders. And this might be the scariest part for the laggards. The leaders aren't taking profits. They're buying more AI. They're reinvesting 47% of their gains back into AI capabilities, creating a flywheel that makes them impossible to catch. And I believe that this reinvestment is poised to increase the speed at which value compounds even further. One of the things that we learned from the Menlo study was that only 16% of enterprise deployments could really qualify as agentic. In other words, systems where an LLM was actually planning and executing the action, observing feedback, and adapting their behavior. And even those that were agentic were very, very simple. However, the companies that are ahead, and the reason that real agentic deployments are still so nascent, is that even more than co-pilots, they require some actual organizational infrastructure to be built to really get those gains. Data needs to be organized, ready, and accessible. Specific tool calling needs to be wired into the design of systems and to be able to plug into the systems that already exist, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, organizations are learning that to really get the most out of agentic and autonomous AI, they have to redesign the stack to support it. However, they're starting to do that. And once they're able to actually deploy autonomous agents that can do bigger, more complex chunks of work, the compounding flywheel that increases their separation from the laggards is just going to move faster and move them farther ahead. Effectively, you have advantage loops that compound in an increasing fashion as they move to scale. 
Individuals build AI skills, save time, discover more and more advanced use cases, and get more value. Those skilled individuals then create organizational momentum. They start to embed AI into more complex workflows, which allow at the organization level for the capture of more productivity gains, which get reinvested in AI capabilities and increasingly build structural advantages. Those structural advantages are then used to reshape markets. Structural advantages turn into new benchmarks for current offerings in terms of how fast you can produce them, how much you can produce, or at what cost. But it's not just current products. Remember, 39% of leading organizations are reinvesting into R&D and 42% are reinvesting in new AI capabilities, meaning that in addition to producing the current crop of products and services faster, better, cheaper, they're also innovating new product lines. Those new product lines are going to give them revenue advantages, all of which leads to more investment and a compounding competitive moat. The point ultimately is that being behind or ahead in AI is not linear scale. The organizations that are behind now are likely to get farther behind. The organizations that are ahead now are likely to get farther ahead, which is of course good news for the leaders and very bad news for the laggards. And to top it all off, as I said, I think it's going to get even more dramatic as those leaders increasingly put the infrastructure in place that allows them to fully tap into more autonomous and agentic AI. Anyways, guys, as I've been watching all of these enterprise surveys, it feels to me like this is one of the most important subtextual lessons that was really worth digging out in deeper fashion. And so I hope you found this useful. If you did, and if you happen to find yourself in one of those laggard organizations, tell your colleagues why you're right to advocate for more determined and concerted AI efforts. For now, that's going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Appreciate you listening or watching as always. And until next time, peace 